trust in mainstream media has hit new lows in recent years. But author Paul Matsko is reminding us we've been here before. His new book is titled The Radio Right, How a Band of Broadcasters Took on the Federal Government and Built the Modern Conservative Movement. And for more, Paul Matsko joins me now. Paul, thanks very much for being with us. Where did the idea for your book come from? It came because I realized that, that radio somehow manages to remain uh, an underrated form of mass media, a way of forming ideology for millions of Americans. Um, and that was true in the 1960s, and it's true today. And based on what we know about the evolution of the media over the years, why do you believe the public has lost trust in media today, and what would it take to restore that? That's a great question. So. In the 1950s and 60s, uh, conservatives didn't feel represented in the mainstream media. And that's a complaint you continue to hear now. Um, and in that absence, that, that feeling that they weren't being represented by journalism, by the mainstream outlets, they created their own counter institutions. Um, to some extent, those institutions have become echo chambers today, uh, but they are response to a feeling of lack and of loss. Uh, in the 1960s, there was, a, for the first time in American history, a group of right-wing radio broadcasters with a truly nationwide reach and an audience in the tens of millions. Um, anywhere in the country, almost all day, every day, you could listen to right-wing radio in the 1960s and hear a message about how well the Kennedy administration was destroying America, um, how, you know, uh, liberal institutions were antipathetic to conservatives. Um, and that was that was different. There had been conservative broadcasters before that, but they tended to be isolated voices on network radio. So in the 1960s, you have this new wave of mass right-wing broadcasting with an audience uh, of up, a, up to 20 million people uh, a week. And 20 million people, that's as many as Rush Limbaugh at his peak some 40 years later, despite a much larger national population. So they created these alternate institutions, a way of spreading conservative ideas, of building grassroots conservative uh, organizations, of, of engaging in activism. And that is something that we see in the 1960s that we're seeing repeated today uh, in new mass media spaces, on social media, uh, on the internet, uh, through, through online outlets. And so we're seeing a similar kind of moment of mass right-wing media forms leading to mass right-wing organization and activism. Yeah, so let me ask you a little bit more about that. When you look at the landscape today, how much influence does conservative radio especially continue to have? Uh, quite a bit. Uh, so Rush Limbaugh, any given week, has some 15 million on-air listeners. Uh, that's, that's a low estimate. He would actually uh, say there's a much higher number who, if you include all of his various streaming options online and, and, and through downloads and the like. Um, so. We're talking at a bare minimum 15 million Americans, as I wrote about in my New York Times op-ed, um, who, and I think this is important to realize and what differentiates radio from television or even newspapers, is that radio permeates all other spaces. It has the, the true ability to uh, influence you in every aspect of your life. So you can turn on AM radio, listen to talk radio in the car on the way to work uh, while you're working on the factory floor or at the workbench. You can have it on in, in, in the truck if you're a truck background. Uh, it can follow you wherever your smartphone goes. So in that regard, it is a truly versatile medium that can that can totalize one's worldview. Um, and there's so much of it that be, besides the top uh, 15 shows, each of which have millions of listeners. There are hundreds of re regional shows, which might have listeners in the tens or hundreds of thousands. So there's a, a sheer, the volume of right-wing radio, talk radio that comes out is astonishing. And so even though the absolute numbers of talk radio listeners is, is not a majority of Americans by any stretch of the imagination, they are highly motivated. And, and you know, if you look at organizations like the National Rifle Association, what highly motivated minorities can get done in politics or prevent from getting done, as the case may be. 
Well, you've also noted that President Trump has suggested the government intervene to ensure Facebook and Twitter treat conservative content uh, fairly. In his view, the president has also pushed to challenge TV network licenses. What is the president's role in media regulation, and under what circumstances might the FCC or any government agency actually intervene? So officially, he has very little role at all. Uh, the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, which uh, issues licenses to radio stations, is an independent agency. However, uh, the members, the commissioners of the FCC, are appointed by the president. And if you want to have a long and healthy future career, it bodes you well to listen to the president and to respond to his requests, uh, official or not. And there's a long history of that being true. In the 1960s, uh, President John F. Kennedy told the uh, head, the, the chairman of the FCC, uh, keep radio stations fair. And what he meant by that was keep them fair to me. <laughs> we want to cut down the amount mm -hmm. of radio broadcasting that criticizes the administration um, using something called the Fairness Doctrine at the time, which was responsible for arguably the most successful censorship campaign of the last half century in American history, targeting right-wing broadcasters. Today, uh, the same thing's true. Donald Trump has technically no authority over um, over broadcast content or over social media content, but it's not going to stop him from trying to place informal pressure on the FCC. Uh, one of the ways in which he's done that recently has been proposals to remove Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. It's a law from the 90s that made the modern internet uh, in its kind of free and fair and open form possible. Uh, it protects uh, internet platforms from civil liability uh, for content posted by users. Uh, he has proposed junking Section 230 uh, in doing so because he doesn't like um, the way in which social media platforms have, in, in his belief, punished conservative voices, have downgraded or algorithmically punished conservative voices. Uh, recently, there was the New York Post article that was pulled by Twitter about Hunter Biden. Uh, that did not make the president happy and listed another call for the end of Section 230. So even though he has no formal power to issue, as Kennedy did, a fairness doctrine campaign in the 60s, or as Trump would like to do uh, with, a, with a Section 230 repeal, he can put pressure on uh, the FCC to uh, enforce or selectively not enforce certain regulations and reward his political allies and punish his political opponents. All right, Paul Matsko, really fascinating to see how the conservative landscape as it exists today, the media landscape, the foundations for that were really laid uh, decades ago. Thanks so much, Paul, for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you.